ready? Good evening. Tonight we have a um, town board workshop meeting and a public hearing uh, for Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. Um, we're going to start with an executive session. I'll point out the exits are here and here to the right, and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, so, I, do I have a motion to open? So, real quick, to, just to do roll call this evening, oh, we sorry. do have present with us uh, Deputy Supervisor Vicki Doyle. And here, can we here? Pardon? Here. Here. Sorry. <laughs> Council <laughs> Persons Blackman. Here. Revelard. Here. Great, thank <laughs> you. And now we can start with our executive session. Do we need to open that? So there's, is there a motion to go into executive session for the purposes of I'll interviews? I'll second. Okay, Blackman, Revelard. Uh, Deputy Supervisor yes. Doyle, Blackman and Revelard? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so noted. Okay. Now we're in executive session. So, okay, so I uh, will make a motion that we um, come out of executive session and return to regular town board meeting on Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. I'll second that. Deputy Supervisor Doyle? Yes. Council Members Blackman? Yes. Revelard? Yes. Okay. Uh, do I, uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that we open the public hearing amending workforce housing law and relevant zoning code sections and and close the public hearing. Oh, okay, nope, close the hearing. Yeah. Okay, so, so we're just the opening hearing. the public yeah, hearing. Is there a first. second? I'll second that, yeah. yeah. It, it will be as soon as we vote. just record the vote. Supervisor, Deputy Supervisor Doyle? Yes. Councilpersons uh, Blackman? Yes. And Revelard? Yes. Okay. Yes, public comment. And just before we start public comment, just to advise the audience and all of our guests here that are in the room, the town, regular town board meeting did begin at 6.30 this evening, where the board, as you heard, went into executive session. No action was taken, but they're returning to the regular meeting. And Sharon Kroger is here. Um, in regard to the suggested amendments to the, let's see, how, how, how all right, resolution number 27, where else? Okay, the, the amendments to the housing law. I'm not going to try to address all of this, but I want to point out several things that I think need to be worked further and shouldn't be uh, passed yet. Okay. The, the section E. It's, uh, I have it on page six. It's, uh, okay. it's the section that deals with this difficult question where the federal regulations for a lot of the money that's coming down currently is somewhat different from what some of the local plans have asked for. Now, when we designed our, our, our comprehensive plan the last time round, there was a lot of discussion from the community, from people who were talking about their situations, and it was clear that people who needed, especially needed workforce housing, or uh, I guess we'll call it workforce housing now, um, were the, the obvious ones, folks who've lived here a long time but who wanted to continue living here but for some reason or another it, were no longer living in the, the large house or the big parent's house or someone's house, so that it was basically young people that wanted to stay in the community, that might have jobs in the community, and especially who had become um, uh, apprenticed in the volunteer fire uh, structure with the volunteer firefighters. And we had also heard from people with, from the schools who were working in the schools, teaching or other jobs, but who couldn't live here 
because there was no availability of something they could afford. So the attempt when this, the, the original language was, was chosen was to accommodate these people in the best interest of the town. So the goal was not merely what's good for the individual who's getting it, but what's good that the town needs from this. It's, it's it had a multiple mission. It wasn't a simple one, the way it might have been in a large city, or in uh, even Kingston, or Albany, or somewhere else. Tiny towns have a different set of issues sometimes. And one of our issues, Amenia, believe it or not, as small as it is, we have to staff two volunteer fire departments. That means that if you've got guys that grew up in town and who were volunteers in, in their teenage years learning how to run these fire trucks and, and, and take responsibility. Sharon, all of this stuff, I mean, I'll let you finish, but I mean, the, the housing board has been discussing all of that as part of the, so, as part of the three years so what of I'm, conversation and study. So specifically what I'm getting at here is that section E, which eliminates all the priorities that are written I can understand you're wanting to change it somewhat because it has rigidity in it, but it's not okay to just get rid of it. I think that that should really be reviewed. And the second thing that I'm concerned about is in section N, I don't believe that that's been carefully enough considered the whole question of mandatory workforce housing and the connections among the governmental entities. I don't think this has been thought through. It looks more like boilerplate that's used in some cities, but it doesn't really apply carefully enough to this What are you town. referring to, Sharon? I'm not understanding that. The exactly. section entitled Mandatory Workforce Housing, which talks about various things the applicants can do instead of X or Y or Z. I think that the process needs to be thought through a little more carefully. And that's all I want to say about I'm that. sorry, are you talking about the, the person who occupies the unit or the developer no, who builds no, the, the unit? No, the, no, the process that you, I think when the lawyer looks at it more closely, he'll see what's bothering me. It's page 14 and 15 in your draft. It has to do with how it interfaces with the other aspects of government. The who's who, who does what to whom, and under what circumstances, that connections among the different. It also has to do with the fact that you've taken out the role of the town board out of so many of these um, sections that where you then want to relate to the somebody that the town board has created, such as a planning board or a, um, a, 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 a something, something with the comp plan, it, it, that's not well considered. I can just say it's not good craftsmanship. So those are my two comments. Okay, thank you. Mr. Virginia, George wants to, oh, sure. Uh, George, you're next, I guess. So Bob Turtles. Okay. Can you open it a little? I mean, if the stuff on that side, can you open it a little more? And maybe even. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do uh, you want to share this with the viewing audience? I'd love to. Uh, we need to get that repositioned. You see the camera up there to the right of the tapestry? Oh, look at that. If you saw it over here, I have the attorney. I can probably focus in on that. Uh, I think. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is George Bistranson. Should Amenia be rural or suburban? Some of the proposed workforce housing zoning changes will help suburbanize Amenia quickly and irrevocably. Amenia is not the right place for promoting workforce housing. The shortage of affordable housing is an international problem that's been around for many years. Building housing is expensive, a small entity like Amenia isn't equipped to make much of a difference. There are better places with existing infrastructure, a larger tax base, and expertise. But Amenia is exceptional for the amount of open space it has and should continue to preserve its woods, meadows, and farms. 
If you're incentivizing the building of houses, you are disincentivizing the preserving of open space. If you support zoning changes that encourage building, you will destroy the small town, rural nature of Amenia. Keeping Amenia rural is going to be difficult, but it's the most precious legacy we can leave future generations. I want to address some of the proposed changes. In the accessory unit section 12112B, the following sentence is proposed. Nothing in the provisions shall preclude the construction of an addition to an existing structure or new structure to accommodate additional units in compliance with the density and dimensional standards of the applicable zoning district. If I understand this, only density and dimensional standards can be considered. There are many other important considerations, the environmental impact, noise, traffic, parking, historical and architectural integrity, all should be taken into consideration. Neighbors should have an opportunity to voice their concerns. If an inadequate septic system is an of an accessory apartment is going to affect your well, will this be precluded from the, the decision making? Workforce housing shouldn't be given priority importance over everything else. There are other concerns. Incentivizing accessory units is not good planning. How many accessory units are we going to get? 10, 100, 1,000? Is there a plan? In fact, there's no planning involved. Instead of designing a community that people will want to live in, all is left up to individual whims. You get what you pay for. If we must have workforce housing, we deserve houses that are attractive and well-designed and located on a suitable site, a site that isn't currently habit habitated by wildlife, perhaps the Taconic Development Disabilities Campus or one of the gravel mines. The density bonus system encourages dense suburban developments in our countryside. As I understand the density bonus system, a developer sets aside 25% of the workforce housing and then is able to build houses closer together. So instead of requiring five acres to build a house in the rural residential area, houses could be built on two and a half acres. This is a bonanza for the developers and a blueprint for eliminating open, house, open space in Amenia. If we must let more tract housing be built, the developer should make a real contribution to the community. The formula to build workforce housing in 121-42 seems overly generous to the developer. It should be less expensive for a developer to build a workforce unit than to pay the in lieu of option. Isn't it better to have the developer build the house than the town build it? So why not make the in lieu of option the more expensive option? Why is the in lieu of option why is the in lieu of option amount based on the median income? Why isn't it based on the median cost of building a new house? Why should the developer only have to contribute to workforce housing, the workforce housing trust fund if he's built 10 or more market rate units? Shouldn't every new market rate construction have to make a contribution? If we must lose our precious open space, let's at least get something significant in return. Uh, there's a 7.5 acre wooded parcel at the corner of Yellow City Road and Sheffield Road. It's adjacent to a 42 acre parcel owned by the Miley family, mostly marshland. The Miley parcel was awarded a bog turtle conservation easement. Bog turtles are small and shy. Uh, they only live in small isolated pockets. I brought you some pictures of the bog turtles. The main source of water for this marsh goes through this 7.5 acre parcel that's for sale. Uh, in, instead of a workforce housing trust fund, I would rather the town had an open space trust fund that could buy this land and protect the wildlife. With the current, current zoning, one house can be built on this 7.5 acre lot, which is in the agricultural residential zone. With the proposed zoning changes, one workforce house and two market rate houses can be built on this parcel. Is that what you really want to do? 
I hope you'll reconsider the zoning changes in a way that keeps Amenia rural. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Vicky, can I respond? Sure. Um, um, George, absolutely. a couple of things I want to mention. One is that right now at the, at the Millerton Library, there's an exhibit of uh, affordable housing uh, actually as built examples. And one of the things that I thought was really useful about that is that all of the projects they showed looked like houses and looked like fairly traditional houses. So I think that's important for you to see, to know that we're not talking about six-story brick buildings. Um, the other thing is that I was the chair of the, uh, the housing board uh, for three years. And our intent and the intent of the, um, the intent of the density bonus is to try to get uh, the development in the center of Amenia so that we aren't taking space countryside, that countryside isn't being divided into five acre lots so that we're not so, I mean, which is really suburban. The idea is to try to build buildings similar to the ones that are down there now, down in the center of town, in other words. Um, Amenia was much denser and had a much higher population at the turn of the last century than it does now. Um, and it seems that uh, with the number of people we have in Amenia, it's very hard to support local business. So affordable housing in the downtown would accomplish those things and would actually preserve open space. That's what the intent of this is. And in terms of the, um, the fee in lieu of, the fee in lieu of uh, it has been changed because um, when Sila was built, we, we, the town got 50, I'm sorry, got $20,000 for each unit that didn't get built, which was completely ridiculous in terms of, in terms of uh, building affordable housing. So the number that is being used now is comparable to what other towns in Dutchess County have. Uh, I'm not really sure why ours was so low or why it was that was accepted, but that's the major point of the um, of the change to the fee in lieu of because it was embarrassingly low before. So just wanted you to kind of be aware of those things. Thank you, Leo. I also so thank you for addressing some of the design questions and one of the. Uh, affordable housing uh, opportunities is across from the town hall uh, that H Hudson River Housing is pro um, is proposing is going to help the community understand what those design options are. And they have already asked and enlisted the help of residents. We've had three workshops, I believe, that were designed to elicit information from the community about what they saw the design and architecture to reflect. And they have incorporated, I think, our ideas of duplexes that match the similar existing vernacular architecture. I'm not an architect, but um, it, they have tried and they have architects who are working with our particular community. Um, so thank you for handling that and that you also handled a little bit about the density bonus um, and, and why, what the, the point is of trying to keep the density in the areas of the hamlets that have historically been. It's part of our character. What we want to do is maintain it and it's well documented in our comprehensive plan throughout it. How we want to balance the open space with the higher density in the hamlets as this town has grown and evolved. So we're not promoting development everywhere and by doing five acre zoning everywhere, that's what you'll get, a house everywhere. The whole place will look like Levittown or a version of that. And we want to make sure that the open spaces remain clearly available for agriculture, for for food production, for um, the history and tradition and the cultural resources that we have traditionally appreciated, the view sheds and all, all of that has been carefully protected. So I wanted to take take that on. And then the other thing is. Um, I didn't I didn't read that. I didn't read that. that in the, the comprehensive that, plan, that, it is throughout that document. It's not in not, the not, not in this not in part. The comprehensive this plan is, a, is an addendum. That. This is an addendum that is specifically about workforce housing. You need to re reference the whole comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2007 to get the entire um, understanding of what our mission is with these laws. Because it, it was very advanced for 2007. We have a, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I guess. I think it would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, if Ashley wants to come. Microphones, please, if you're going to speak, a microphone. 
So I can give a little bit more context to this discussion. So mm -hmm. um, almost two years ago now, we started working with the housing board on ways that we could increase the availability of workforce housing within the town of Amenia while respecting the uh, goals and objectives of the existing comprehensive plan, which as uh, Councilwoman Doyle mentioned, um, definitely emphasizes the preservation of open space, the preservation of Amenia's historical agricultural uh, character, as well as the historic resources within the town, um, which is why what you already had in your zoning code was a really good basis for doing conservation subdivisions and things of that nature where you look at trying to maintain large tracts of open space while concentrating development in a smaller footprint so that you can have a walkable community, that you can have more affordable housing, more workforce housing, um, but maintaining larger areas of open space. So the goal of these amendments and the corresponding addendum, um, the addendum documents the need for this affordable housing, for workforce housing and affordable housing. Um, as we've seen over the last 20 years, the need has actually increased. Um, so we've documented that. And then what is in the proposed local law are ways that we can tweak the zoning code without going and changing the zoning map, without going and drastically changing the density provisions, um, but things that we can do to make it easier to build more workforce housing and to make it easier for what we consider um, some of the low-hanging fruit of affordable housing, things like accessory apartments and the preservation of naturally affordable housing. Um, so one of the questions that I heard was about section 121-12B1. Um, that provision of the code, you, your code already allowed the conversion of existing buildings to multifamily. Um, all this does is clarify that if someone wanted to convert an existing building, if they wanted to put a small addition on that building to um, add a couple more units or make it more ADA accessible, they would be allowed to do so, but they would have to comply with the existing zoning code, it would have to meet the applicable setbacks, it would have to meet the applicable density requirements, and it would have to go through the traditional site plan approval process. It's not, it's not um, going over that, it's not excluding that. You absolutely would, if it's a project that would otherwise require site plan approval, this does not change that. Can you also address uh, septics? He was concerned that um, suddenly we would have um, such a, a bo uh, an increase in um, accessory apartments and structures that we would then have septics. Right, so it very clearly states in this law that if you would like to put in an accessory apartment, you have to have uh, an adequate septic system. It would have to be approved by Dutchess County Health Department. You could not put in an accessory apartment with an inadequate septic system. Can you also address his uh, comment that um, it doesn't appear that we have a plan for how much um, uh, workforce housing uh, this town wants and needs? So we've documented the need in the addendum to the comprehensive plan. Uh, in terms of the quantity that could potentially be built, um, we're not changing the underlying densities of the zoning with this. We are saying that we, we, we did do some density bonuses, so there would be potential for increase there. Um, but if, it's, if it's they met the If they met the various requirements. Uh, requirements. Yeah. Right. So density bonuses begin when you have X number of houses. So they're right. large subdivisions. Large, not, more, 10 or more yeah. lots. So if, if you were, uh, if you had a large piece of property and you met the zoning to be able to subdivide it into 10 or more lots, um, you would, could potentially get a density bonus for providing affordable housing. And can you address his uh, suggestion that um, it is better to increase the fee in lieu of uh, rather than, um, I think his main point, which was a good one, was shouldn't the contractor be um, shouldn't the emphasis be to make the developer provide the fee, the um, affordable housing rather than the town accepting a fee in lieu of? And if we do accept a fee in lieu of, it should be greater than, uh, it, sh it should be as high as possible to actually make it possible for us to produce 
so the I housing. Think towns need to have both. Um, it's important to get some units constructed by private developers as part of a project. It's, and that's one way that it's, it's pretty easy to get units that are in the 60 to 80% AMI. Um, that's usually a comfortable spot for developers. But if you want to get any deeply affordable units, you usually need some additional subsidies. And that's where um, the town can, can take that fee in lieu of um, payment and put that towards some more deeply affordable housing. The other thing it could potentially be used for is the preservation of affordable housing. So you could potentially have a local program where you could give micro loans to homes within the community to help them preserve and maintain existing affordable housing. Stock. So it increases our flexibility, yes. our ability to be creative and assist in a way that's um, fulfilling our particular town's goals. Exactly. And I think that is a very good point that I hadn't thought of, is that it's good to have both, right? There's a place in, in, in it for both of us, and that we are increasing the, we're proposing an yes, increase. Yes, it's proposed to increase with a, a formula that is used in other communities in the Hudson Valley. What's our percentage? Sorry, let me just... Can you also um, touch on the environmental impact of uh, higher density in, in uh, parcels? And the bog turtle, I believe, is either endangered or threatened species. So there is, um, there is no way our community can override what the federal law, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, has deemed a, a, a threatened or endangered. That requires, if there's bog turtle habitat, um, clearly been designated by New York State DEC, I think is the ones who do that, then we have to abide by their rules. The town can't override their uh, protections that have been put in place. Th that's absolutely correct. Um, any of these larger scale projects would be projects that would have to go through the site plan approval process, would have to go through the State Environmental Quality Re Review Act. Um, and during that process, the sites would be evaluated for potential impacts to threatened and endangered species. And another thing I would add to that is if it is a, a workforce housing project that was seeking any state or federal funding, even more so would you have to um, evaluate the potential for threatened or endangered species because that federal, federal funding and state funding can't be applied to projects that would have an impact. So I think the environmental impact, New York State has um, laws that are very, um, specific to uh, protecting uh, our, our environmental uh, resources. And when it hits the flagged uh, species uh, that are endangered or threatened, there's no community. Um, we can't override any of those federally protected um, measures. And then just to answer the question about what the formula is, it's 1.25 times the HUD's um, Dutchess County area median income for a household of four for the year in which the project is approved. So I think your AMI for a family of four is somewhere around $80,000 right now. Okay. Did you have um, a response to um, Sharon, our first speaker, had mentioned some concern about us. I, I think she was referring to the fact that we have um, reduced uh, our emphasis or, or our ability to make our affordable housing more available to school teachers and firemen. So one of the things that this does is it does remove the preference lists that were in right. the previous zoning code. Right. And that is because they, these types of preference lists um, are, have been found to be discriminatory. So the, the, the movement at the federal level is to move away from these types of preference lists. And, and one of the concerns, frankly, is that if you are only opening it up to people that currently would live within your community, you might be missing out on some people that grew up here but moved away and now can't come back. So you, you ha have to be able to balance that and, and open up the door for people who grew up here, people who 
um, maybe moved away. I want to come back. People who are working here and commuting really long distances or to work here. Or younger people who might want to join the fire department. People who might want to join the fire department. Can you speak to the, if you're, if you're getting rid of the preference uh, uh, numbers, which I can understand, because they're very rigid sounding, and these are small towns, so you've, you've been talking about three or four eligible people, not a whole list where you can make numerical statistics. Uh, clarify who gets to decide, because I don't believe that the town, when it wrote the master plan and the comprehensive plan, I don't believe they ever thought that they would not have some committee that could decide preferences based on whatever criteria they worked out. If you don't have enough people in your volunteer fire department, you can't put out fires on anybody's house. So it's one of the few things that this town, as a tiny town, had that would have been uh, uh, enabled it to, to, to shape who stays. When people want to Sharon, can't. you'll have to go to the microphone if you. She understood. Okay, yeah, so if you could paraphrase what she you. just said, that so, would be helpful. Sure. So the the question was, um, how do we ensure that we have adequate housing for our volunteer fire department, right. and make sure that the people who are volunteering in those important services have the availability of affordable housing? And if we don't have a preference list, how do we achieve that? Is that and we have two volunteer fire departments. Uh, Sharon, if you need to talk, uh, um, make a comment, you'll have to go to the microphone. Maybe the people at home <laughs> need it too. Um, I want to say another thing, aside from the fact that that list is illegal, um, the, the, if we have workforce housing, it's an opportunity for people who grew up here and are living in their parents' basement. It's an opportunity for grandparents to move out of their gigantic Victorian and move into a renovated garage so that their, uh, their children and grandchildren can move into the big house. M much of this is allowed by our, our very progressive 2007 zoning code. But we're really in a crisis, and I'm sorry, George, that you uh, were not able to participate earlier in the process of looking at workforce housing, but there's been uh, an enormous amount of time spent. Charlie, who's behind you, is the chair now of, of the Affordable Housing Committee. But it, we have documented, um, aside from the fact that it's mentioned several times in the comprehensive plan, we've also documented the number of people in Amenia who are paying more than 30% of their, uh, of their salary for rent, and it's kind of staggering. I think it was almost 50, it was getting close to 50%. So those people are not able to afford to live here without sacrificing food or gasoline or you know extracurricular activities for kids. The, um, the, the major employers in this town now are hospitality, meaning uh, Troutbeck and Four Brothers and Silo Ridge. The people who work there are living in, who are also Sharon supposed to. Sharon Hospital. I mean, yes, and Sharon Hospital. So Sharon, but the point of this is that there isn't housing for people who are in their first jobs. No one can afford to live here, and unless we build affordable housing in the center of town where people can walk to things, we're never going to have enough activity downtown to make Amenia a place worth stopping in or moving to. And we're also excluding people who would be teachers or volunteer firemen, people who are essential service providers like postmen and FedEx drivers and people who work in the hospital. And that's the reason for this. I mean, the whole point of this is to make sure that this town doesn't ossify and die, which it certainly will if we don't have a plan for the future of the town which is, I think, what this is leading towards. So we have... Yes, someone's been waiting for more, a long, long more time. More public comments, I believe? A, yes. If you could state your name and where you live. And sure, I'm Hannah. I'm new here. I live just up the road. Um, I bought Wayne's house. That means ah. something to a lot of people. Um, yeah, just uh, two houses up. Um, my question is, and I'm really just here to listen. I'm Again, I'm new and learning. Um, but... If there's language in a comprehensive document about the fact, like, you answered a question about housing density and, like, the whole purpose of 
that language is to encourage that density downtown where like the existing footprints look that way and it's sort of of a kind with what's already there and there's lots of upsides to that being walkable, but that that language isn't in the addendum. My question is, is there any reason, why isn't it in the addendum and can it not just, is there a specific reason that it can't be stated or restated there? Uh, Ashley, can you explain how this process came to be such? Sure. So um, you could bring your microphone down. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things to keep in mind is that this was not a wholesale rewrite of the zoning code or the comprehensive plan. This was a targeted look at both documents for the purpose of affordable housing. So there are the, the zoning code that the town has that was done back in 2007 is very progressive and has a lot of language about um, the preservation of open space and the proper way of doing subdivisions to make sure that you are maintaining uh, the agricultural character and, and natural resources. So this, the goal of this project was not to go back and redo any of that. It was to focus on how can we interject more affordable and workforce housing into those existing parameters. So that's why it doesn't go into those sections of the code. It, the code changes are very focused on the sections that are applicable to affordable and workforce housing. It, it doesn't touch the other sections uh, because the understanding is that the town um, is finding that those sections of the code are working well and that they're consistent with the comprehensive plan and worth maintaining. So we are in fact looking at the all overall comprehensive plan and tweaking it to make sure it's up to date and things have changed since 2007. We want to make sure that the uh, factual reality is represented correctly and so we will be updating that part as well but it this is on a two-track program the addendum is critical to get done as soon as possible and the rest of the comprehensive plan that language is going to re remain much the same the intent is the same and that if you want you need to read that preamble in order to understand the whole um, uh, goals that we're trying to achieve. Correct. I'm trying to follow yeah. the rules and use the microphone. I guess I'm just saying, yeah. if it's if there's a way to just state it so simply that that's the intent, uh -huh. it feels very worthwhile again to just like to restate that or to pull from the focal document into an addendum. It just mm -hmm. like if it you know if it's confusing or potentially misleading, and then you can explain it so so clearly in half of one sentence. Right. Br bring the half sentence to the so new party. So perhaps the vision statement could be at the top, which does incorporate the overall goals of the town in, in a succinct paragraph, although we are looking at, at tweaking that up a bit. Oh, sure. I mean, we did, we did originally take a look at the full code and did a whole red, or the comp plan and did a whole red line of where we could tweak things. Um, and that that raised a lot of community concern, so that's right. why we went the addendum route. Um, we can add some additional language to the introduction in the addendum to clarify that this is an, an addendum and yeah. it's not, you know, it's gonna replacing be anything that's within the rest of the code. Yeah, but it'll be clear once you add it to the rest of the code. It's yes. an addendum, so you have to remember you're reading an addendum to a, a, the overall document. Can I quickly? Hi, I'm Hi Charlie, Charlie Miller. I'm the, uh, the head of the housing board. And I just want to bring a little clarification to it. The, so the local law changes are part of a very large local law that has zoning um, that uh, Ashley has spoken about. None of that changes. The, the changes that we're making here, or the edits, are really focused on three main categories. One is uh, the fee in lieu of that any, any developer building 10 or more units pays. Um, it increases that to the 1.25 times the Dutchess County AMI. Um, and it's based on when that development is done. So the AMI generally keeps going up. Um, currently now, our fee in lieu of is not pegged to, to a moving target. Um, it also clarifies when that fee in lieu of is, is due that first either the developer builds the workforce housing that's required um, or they pay the fee in lieu of 
before they get any COs for um, their market rate uh, units, our current code is confusing and it's backwards. So ultimately a developer can build uh, their market rate stuff and then they pay the fee in lieu of a graduated uh, phasing schedule but afterwards. Um, it, it does uh, remove the preference list which is discriminatory. Um, and the truth of the matter is we have to be cognizant of how workforce slash affordable housing is built. It is funded. That funding comes through the federal government, either directly through the feds or money that goes from the feds to the state and is administered by the state. And the feds require that you advertise broadly. You can't have preference lists. I mean, it's all based off of what a household's income is. I mean, that is the sole determining factor. Um, and in this, the town, I think wisely, as did the housing board, realized it would be great to have a third party, nonprofit, affordable housing uh, organization manage that process. And so the code changes and allows for the um, housing board with the, and the, the board to hire that third party. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the way it's done everywhere, truthfully, unless you're a really big municipality. You know, we don't have the bandwidth to. Uh, receive applications for housing and to sign leases and do all of that, that would be a third party. Um, and then the density bonus. Our town code already allows for density bonuses, but it didn't allow for density bonuses if you set aside affordable housing. Um, it allowed a 50% density bonus if you had a conservation um, subdivision. So that is, again, our comprehensive plan looks to keep you know, open area, and to conserve that, so if you were a developer and you had the right to put so many units in a place, if you group them all, you got a density bonus. So we are saying if you group them all and you set aside a certain amount for affordable housing, you get a density bonus. There's two real ways that affordable housing is built in this country. One, it's through inclusion, which is what our code already does. It says that you have to include workforce housing if you build 10 or more units or you pay a fee. So we already had that. Um, and the other is to give somebody an incentive to, to build workforce housing. So in this we say, if you actually include 25% of your development is workforce housing, you set it aside for that, you'll get a density bonus. Um, most people, it's very difficult for the economics to work for a developer um, to build the housing. That's why they almost always opt for fee in lieu of. And if you make your fee in lieu of too high, they just won't build to begin with. So you don't get any units, right? We have to realize that we don't only have a crisis of affordable units for people who make, you know, in, in Amenia, our, the AMI for just Amenia is like $64,000 for a family. You know, that could be a family of four. I mean, that's not a lot of money, and it becomes very difficult to build housing for those. But we also have people who make more, and we don't have, like, middle-income housing either, you know? Um, so that's where the density comes in and helps possibly for a developer to say, oh, it's economically feasible for me to develop and also set aside affordable housing for people. So um, anyway, I just wanted to kind of give the scheme as to where this came from. Uh, I have some questions I'm not sure about. Um, is the density bonus allowed in the agricultural residential area? I mean, certainly the uh, conservation um, bonus is allowed there, right? I believe it is. You ha in so agricultural can... areas, you have to follow our zoning, and in agricultural areas, with uh, they are, it's already designed to try to encourage open space preservation. But the law is the law. I mean, if it's if you have density bonus in the agricultural residential area, that 7.5 parcel is going to get three houses only one workforce. Uh, also, is it, I just want to be clear about, maybe I'm making a mistake, but does the density bonus, uh, is it in effect for building under 10 houses? It doesn't. It has to be 10 houses before the bonus takes I effect? I believe so. Or it I has don't to be think all you get affordable. any. It, well, it said 20, I only read 25%. No. So. No? There's actually the ones could I just, uh, also I, I think, the, I don't think the turtle's actually on the endangered list, but I, I think there is a general problem for habitat all through Amenia. I mean, uh, you, you just can't limit it to a few areas. Uh, it needs to be preserved. 
Thank you. Um, the bog turtle is listed endangered. as an endangered species by New York State um, for that question. But in terms of the density bonus, um, microphone, Ashley. I'm sorry. It would not. It it, it applies. Um, it would apply to all zoning districts, but it doesn't override the underlying zoning district. So it, you would still have to meet the other requirements of that, of that section of the code. Well, the more relevant thing, George, is that right now there's a bonus, there's a density bonus for building in the downtown. Uh, if you have wastewater and, and public water and you build in the downtown, you can build uh, eight units where you would only be allowed to build one unit or two units otherwise. And that's essential because the downtown is denser than the rest of Amenia. And so this would, um, this would, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the denser we can keep the center of town, the more that Amenia will continue to feel like Amenia. Um, and well, and it's also important to consider what, that with these density bonuses, you're looking at things like cluster subdivision. So you are trying to concentrate that um, that housing within a portion of the site that is maintaining larger tracts of open space that you are not, um, like as, as Councilwoman Doyle was saying before, you don't have these large lots spread over a large piece of property. You want to make sure you're maintaining contiguous land. So that's that like goal of the of the comp plan and goal of the zoning code would not change with these density bonuses. Okay, are there any other comments? Pat Nelligan, Laval Road in the Water District. Um, George made a lot of good points. Uh, the, the, in lieu of, I think you should look at more. Uh, only because we got burned so badly down the road. I mean, that was absurd, 20,000. But as far as the density issue, I'll take all day long a developer who comes in, builds, let's say he's gonna build 50 units, okay? And we let him build 100 units, but we get 25 units out of it for affordable housing. If he builds 100 units, we get two for one, right? Actually, it's more than that. Uh, if he, they're allowed to build 50% uh, more of 25% is affordable housing. Right. So in a, how many units did, were you well, saying? I'm just 50? giving you a number. Uh, first of all, when you look at Silo Ridge, there is no affordable housing at Silo Ridge. They were supposed to build affordable housing. I, I, I know all about Silo Ridge, and, and I'll get to the, the, the real Silo Ridge issue that comes up at the end here. But picture, if you will, and this is what I want you to get the overview, Sharon. All of Walt Culver's farm, which goes from Powderhouse Road, all up the hill, all the way over to Murphy Hill, all the way across 22, or old 22 to new 22. Picture it looking exactly like the one we got. Picture the Murphy Farm, which starts there and goes up and up and up and over forever, looking like that we have down below. The, the There's nothing literally to stop them from doing that now. There actually is. They're in a scenic well, protection overlay zone, and it's sh and and the comprehensive plan said that the view from Delavern I, I I is sacred, but, essentially. But having gone through what a corporation was willing to do to wear a town down, the sooner you get this on the books, the better. I agree. It may have flaws, but I don't think you should, you should, uh, is the, is the in lieu of, um, in the zoning code issue or the comprehensive plan? Where, where is that low? The in lieu of is in the it's zoning in our code. Law. Then I think you should not, but you, you, you can do the environmental pass tonight that you're saying it, it doesn't have any significant environmental issues. It does, but I'm not gonna fight you on that. Uh, but you should look at that again and, and listen to George and, and some other people about maybe base, just because the feds base it on a house, uh, on a, on income basis does not necessarily mean that we can't base it on a construction basis. 
somehow. Mm. Yeah, I'm just thinking. I'm sorry, how do you mean that, Pat? He's saying what George said. Exactly. Is that um, the fee in lieu of shouldn't, or the, the workforce housing shouldn't be based oh, oh, on the your calculations affordable were in lieu of. affordability. It should be on the cost of construction. Exactly. Somehow. Yeah. At the time of construction. But I don't think that's legal. This is a very specific uh, incentive that we have done. And in the 2007, we were one of the first communities to suggest this fee in lieu of. And I oh, remember I our lawyer saying to us, you can't just ask for the sun and the moon and the stars because this will be legally challenged. Okay. So right. we are that's following a, a very narrow path to what we can and what we cannot do. Okay. And I think Ashley knows more than we do. I mean, since 2007, more communities have done this, more communities have expanded this and gotten away with it, and we are following a very conservative track of what is allowed to be asked of developers. It's okay, I, I agree, I concur, I give up. <laughs> uh, the last issue is assessment and tax collection. That is not addressed in any of this. Okay. And maybe it can't be. Maybe we need to look at that some other way. But from what I can hear, we've gone through hell dealing with these people, not wanting their things assessed before a certain limit or which ones do get assessed for more when. Do we have a handle on how to make that better? And could that be, part, should it be part of this or something in the real estate? Something bigger and broader than this because this problem, I would agree that we walked in yep. with them telling us it would be worth the sun and the moon and the stars and our taxes and we'd have ever, all this money coming in and then, then surprise, time time they don't to take you to court right, right, right. for doing so it. So I think you're absolutely right, but I don't okay, know the legal that's not mechanism. This, but it's no. not part of the affordable no, housing. No, not part okay. of this. And one last one is a personal one. Um, how do I put it that it doesn't get... So, has anyone taken any interest in the problem I brought up last month about uh, uh, the, the Fudgies Plaza water department issue and how to resolve that? Or do we just assume you're not going to? Well, I, we you can't stay, really say that. Stay. This is a public hearing on oh, okay. just the matter. So we just can't matter. That's beyond oh, the I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You mean I have to hang out to all the, that and then come back up? Yeah, we have to sit here. Yeah. I'm not, well, you've heard the question and you know where I live. Have a good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Really, try to picture that whole mountainside covered. Pass this. Are there Good any night, other Pat. comments from the public about the proposed um, workforce housing law? Okay, do I hear a motion to uh, close the public hearing and move I'll into- I'll make that motion. Okay, Second. Regular meeting, Rev. Lauren. Deputy Supervisor Doyle? Yes. Council Persons Blackman? Yes. Rev. Lord. Yes. 8 p.m. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we open the public hearing uh, for the housing amendments to the comprehensive plan. Uh, I'll second that. Deputy Supervisor Doyle? Yes. Council Persons Blackman? Yes. Revlard? Yes. Okay. So are there any uh, com uh, comments from the public specifically about the comprehensive plan amendments? I didn't know it was even up to me. There, I mean, the, the, for people who don't know this, the comprehensive plan actually predated our zoning code, and that's typically the way it's done. And the comprehensive plan is the town's vision for its future. The zoning code is about implementing that. So in order to do what we are doing with affordable housing, our comprehensive plan already speaks in great detail about affordable housing. But the, the, what what we did with the addendum to the comprehensive plan was just update the information in terms of the level of, of, of poverty and the cost of, of houses. So the addendum is statistical um, in the comprehensive plan in the zoning code. Or did I mess that up, Ashley? No, you, you have oh. I didn't know it was on the agenda. I, uh, uh, if I, I have to, I didn't even read it because I didn't think it was up tonight. So uh, may I just 
write you something if I sure, have a comment? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? You may want to put a submission date. Oh, you mean how soon we need a letter from George? Uh, that is a good question. Um, could you? I think it would need would, it would be best if we can get it with before our next meeting, so within the next two weeks, hopefully a few days yeah, before so our next I would, meeting. I would do it before that. I would, if, if today's Thursday. I would have it before next Thursday. Okay. Right. So we have a week to look at it and con uh, consider it before. That would be great. Thank you. So the only thing I would add to what you said is that all zoning needs to be based on a well-reasoned comprehensive plan. So the, the main reason to do this addendum is to support the proposed zoning. So they really go hand in hand and everything we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so is, is, is integrated and related. Right. Thank you. Anyone else have New comments on the comprehensive plan? On the ninth. No, I just thought uh, you should. No, Don. Don raised a good point. It should be. It, it should be noon on the ninth. Date and time should be set. I'm sorry. Ooh, okay. Sorry. It's noon on the eighth. On the ninth. On the so ninth. So if we do Thursday and the ninth, and that'll give okay. me time to circulate it to everybody that needs. George, to have we it. just gave you a more specific deadline. Noon on uh, on Thursday. By noon on the ninth. Thursday the ninth. Thank you. And any other. Uh, comments about uh, either the workforce housing law and the relevant zoning sections or the amendments to the comprehensive plan. Those would need to be in by noon on March 9th. No, just, no, the just this, plan. only the comp plan. Oh, just the comp, the comp plan, plan. Right. sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Can't do the other one. Is this written by the county? I don't know what you're looking at, Sharon. It's with the comprehensive plan addendum. No. That's what you're talking about, right? Uh, yes, that was that was written by uh, our consultant uh, at AKRF. Mm -hmm. Ashley is mm -hmm. from there, and that was working with the uh, the housing board. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I hear a motion to close the public hearing on the housing amendments to the comprehensive plan? So moved. Second. Do you want me to or do you want to? Put the caveat of the written submission. Oh, with Sorry. the exception <laughs> of the uh, deadline for it's written submissions, like I want written to... comments, which is noon on March 9th. Thank right. you. Deputy Supervisor Doyle. Yes. Councilpersons Blackman. Yes. Revelard. Yes. Okay, motion to close the public hearing. No, we just, we just. Oh yeah, we just did yep, that. We okay, just did sorry. That. So now Motion to return to regular meeting. Regular That's meeting. what I meant. Okay. Doyle. Thank you. Second. Oh, second. Yes. I'm sorry. sorry, I can't, this is hard to sit here and try to yeah. see you guys. Yeah, I know. Okay. Doyle. Yes. Blackman. Yes. Revelard. Yes. Okay, so we're starting our regular meeting at 8.07 p.m. Okay, is there any public comment? Word Paco. Okay. Oh, and. Uh, the the Boy Scout uh, part of the meeting does that require uh, comment or speaking? I just wanted to make sure that we weren't, you know. Just listening. Okay. Thank you. See, okay. uh, town clerk's report. <laughs> Good evening. I know he's never going to come back again. <laughs> so this is the fun part of the report where we get to talk about some money. So here in the town clerk's office for the past month of February, the total sales for state, county, and local revenue was $480.75, of which the local town share is $418.75, which is being remitted to the supervisor. For tax collection, uh, of the $7,333,700 dollars and 21 cents we have collected uh five million nine hundred twenty one thousand one hundred fifty three dollars and twenty four cents and of course that what that total remaining is one million four hundred eleven thousand five hundred thirty five dollars and twenty three cents dawn we just clarify that the seven million is not just i'm gonna city, keep i mean not just town tax i'm gonna good thank keep you. going Okay, thank you. That's the whole the town money. No. Okay, so guys, of that, what has happened is the way that the breakdown is the general fund, these following funds have all been in special districts have been paid in full. Total amount 
to the general fund was $1,183,392. Highway, $889,808. Amenia Library, $175,000. Amenia Fire, $981,735. Amenia Lighting, $18,500. Amenia Water, $44,044. Wasaik Fire, $443,350. Wasaik Lighting, $6,700. Reed Levied Water, $23,432.44. For a total that has been remitted to the town for the General Fund Highway and our special districts, totaling $3,765,900. $961.44, with the remaining difference being paid to the county as part of the warrant. Uh, the county has been paid their first check of a million dollars. That's went out today. The next million will go out on Monday. And then as the remainder of the month continues and collection proceeds, uh, the remaining money will be turned to the county. So the town and its special districts has been satisfied in full. Does that begin to answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> so yes, I'm collecting 7.3, of which only um, a little less than half is to the town. Um, I'm also presenting to the board this evening, we have some resignations. Um, I am now in receipt of Matthew Schniff's resignation from the Housing Board and the Wastewater and Charlotte Murphy from the Ethics Board. Huh. Okay. I'll make a motion that we accept with regret Math Matthew Schnepp's resignation from the Housing Board and the Wastewater Committee. I'll second that. Doyle? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Rebelard? Yes. I move that we accept with regret, great regret actually, Charlotte Murphy has served for many years on the Board of Ethics and she is resigning. And we accept that with, with regret. I'll second that. Doyle? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Rebelard? Yes. Um, also just gonna, uh, for the board's purposes, the uh, acknowledgement and receipt of uh, comments that we received earlier from Mr. Uh, written comments that we received earlier from Mr. Nelligan prior to this evening's meeting has been circulated. Uh, other than that, that'll conclude the, the short town clerk report for this evening. Can I also make a motion that mm -hmm. we um, appoint uh, Tom Buselowitz to the Enhancement Committee? Oh, right. Oh, yeah, we can. I'll second that. I'm sorry. I was trying to figure out how to spell his last name. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> Doyle? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Rebelard? Yes. So our next okay. item is to uh, um, to read the resolution to adopt the negative declaration for work ho workforce housing and relevant zoning codes sections to the local oh, oh and the zoning code sections. So, so this evening we're beginning with resolution number 39. Okay. Before we do that, Ian, could you just explain generally why we're doing this, what the negative declaration means relative to the stuff that we just closed the hearing on? For so our viewing audience. So for our viewing audience, uh, the secret requirements require um, that any, uh, an environmental review for any action taken by the town. And there are categories of actions, type one, type two, and unlisted. This particular action was deemed a type one action. If it's a type one action, it requires that <clears throat> the town take um, kind of a, a deeper look into the environmental impacts. Um, and it requires a particular form to be filled out, which is the environmental assessment form. There's a short form and a long form. Uh, this was we used a, a long form here, um, uh, which our planner had put together for us. Um, and it, there's basically three essential parts to it. Uh, at the end of the review and the analysis, uh, the town has to uh, make a determination on whether or not there's any adverse environmental impact, uh, which this, resolution, um, if passed, will indicate that uh, there is not an environmental or an adverse environmental impact 
and uh, it would be a negative declaration. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is resolution adopting uh, resolution number 39, adopting negative declaration with respect to local law number. You leave it as X. X of the year 2023, amending workforce housing law and other relevant zoning code sections to preserve and promote affordable housing within the town of Amenia. Whereas the town board of the town of Amenia by resolution number 27 of 2023 introduce for consideration local law number X of the year 2023, amending workforce housing law and other relevant zoning code sections to preserve and promote affordable housing within the town of Amenia. And whereas resolution number 27 of 2023 designated the town board of the town of Amenia as lead agency for purposes of secret review as it is solely the, it is the sole agency having approval authority over the action, and whereas resolution number 27 of 2023 designated the proposed action as a type one action for purposes of secret review, and whereas the town board has reviewed part one of a full environmental assessment form EAF and thereafter caused it to be prepared and reviewed parts two and three of the full EAF, now, therefore, be it resolved as follows. The recitations above set forth are incorporated in this resolution as if fully set forth and adopted herein. Two, the town board hereby finds and determines that it, A, it has considered, considered the proposed action, reviewed all parts of the full EAF, reviewed the criteria set forth in 6NYCRR section 617.7C, thoroughly analyzed the relevant areas of potential environmental concern and has duly considered all of the potential environmental impacts and their magnitude in connection with the proposed action. And B, the top, the adoption of local law number X of the year 2023, amending workforce housing law and other relevant co zoning code sections to preserve and promote affordable housing within the town of Amenia will not result in any large and important environmental impacts and therefore will not have a significant adverse impact on the environment. Three, the reasons supporting this determination are set forth on the attached notice of determination of non-significance with respect to this project, a copy of which is on file in the office of the town clerk of the town of Amenia. Four, the town board as lead agency with reference to the above described action hereby, A, adopts a negative declaration pursuant to 6NYCRR section 617.7, with respect to the proposed action, and B, authorizes the supervisor of the town of Amenia to sign the negative declaration and determination of non-significance with respect to the project, and C, directs the town clerk to publish a notice in the, in the environmental notices bulletin, ENB, and D, directs the town clerk to file a copy of said negative declaration and determination of non-significance in the records of the town. This resolution resolution shall take uh, take effect immediately. I'll make uh, that motion. Thank you. I'll second it. Deputy Supervisor Doyle. Yes. Councilpersons Blackman. Yes. And Rebelard. Yes. Hey, Leo, do you want to read the second resolution? Really? You mean it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me just, just find it. You can find it. Oh, here it is. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Um, resolution number, what is this? 40. 40 of 2023. Uh, resolution adopting negative declaration with respect to amending the town of Amenia comprehensive plan. Whereas the Town Board of the Town of Amenia by resolution number 28 of 2023 introduced for consideration amendments to the Town of Amenia comprehensive plan to promote affordable housing within the Town of Amenia. And whereas resolution number 28 of 2023 designated the Town Board of the Town of Amenia as lead agency for the purposes of secret review as it is the sole agency having approval authority over the action. And whereas resolution number 28 of 2023 designated the proposed action as type one action for purposes of secret review. And whereas the town board has reviewed part one of a full environmental assessment form, 
EAF and therefore cause to be prepared and reviewed parts two and three of the full EAF. Now therefore be it resolved as follows. One, the recitations above set forth are incorporated in this resolution as if fully set forth and adopted herein. Two, the town board here, hereby finds and determines that A, it is considered the proposed action, reviewed all parts of the full EAF, review the criteria set forth in 6 NYC RR section 617.7C, thoroughly analyze the relevant areas of potential environmental concern, and has duly considered all of the potential environmental impacts and their magnitude in connection with the proposed action. And B, the adoption of the amendments to the Town of Amenia Comprehensive Plan will not result in any large and important environmental impacts, and therefore will not have a significant adverse impact on the environment. Three, the reasons supporting this determination are set forth in the attached notice of determination of non-significance with respect to this project, a copy of which is on file in the office of the town clerk of the town of Amenia. Four, the town board is lead agency with reference to the above described action hereby A, adopts a negative declaration pursuant to 6 NYCRR section 617.7 with respect to the proposed action, and B, authorizes the supervisor of the town of Amenia to sign the negative declaration and determination of non-significance with respect to the project, and C, directs the town clerk to publish a notice in the environmental notices bulletin ENB, and D, directs the town clerk to file a copy of said negative declaration and determination of non-significance in the records of the town. Five, this resolution shall take effect immediately. I'll make that motion. And I'll second. Deputy Supervisor Doyle? Yes. Councilpersons Blackman? Yes. Rebelard? Yes. Okay. Wait, there's another resolution somewhere. No, I don't have it either. It's the one in the clip. Um, the one in the clip. Where did it go? Okay, the silent easement. Okay, so oh, we've done that. We've it's done that. So our next oh, resolution is for the silent you. easement. And we had some questions that have now been answered. My main question is why is this needed? Because I've never seen us uh, provide an easement of this type and it's it ensures that it will operate this this um, dry, it'll be operated as a dry a private it's a it's a driveway not a private road and so as a driveway I, I guess you need to have easements uh, in this particular case again this was a determination by the planning board this is just um, the follow through on a requirement from the planning board for approval of the project. Um, but if we're signing the easement, then the town needs to just approve of it. Right. And the second issue that I raised was um, I was concerned about emergency services providers since Silo and Siland will be gated um, to make sure that the fire department and other rescue uh, vendors uh, can can get there. And in fact, they've made an agreement with the fire department. There will be a key in a box that will unlock, unlock the gates. So one less thing to worry about. So this is resolution 41? Yes. Okay, so resolution authorizing the silent easement, silent easement agreement. It's resolution number 41 of 2023. Whereas the Town of Amenia Planning Board received an application from Silent Commercial Property LLC for special permit and site plan review approval of a recreation business which includes, among other things, a field and pool house, ice house, warming hut, and tennis, pickleball, and paddle tennis courts, sledding area, ball field, playground, and multi-purpose fields supported by associated parking and utilities the facility also includes a proposed eight foot tall fence on an adjoining property along the project's northern property boundary. And whereas the facility will be constructed on a 53 plus or minus acre parcel owned by Silent, consisting of parcel number 32000-7066-00-910219, situated at 4391 New York State Route 22 in the town of Amenia, Dutchess County, New York. 
uh, hereafter called the site. And whereas on March 23rd, 2022, the Planning Board approved the facility by resolution number four of 2022 titled Resolution Granting S Special Permit and Site Plan Approval for Silent Recreation Facility. Uh, here and after called the approval, subject to grant of certain rights and easements over real property owned by Harlem Valley LLC, the grantor, and situated at 4429 New York State Route 22 in the town of Amenia, Dutchess County, New York, the grantor parcel, and a previously recorded easement agreement known as the Silo Ridge Field Club easement agreement dated May 6, 2016 and recorded in the Dutchess County Clerk's Office as document number 02-2016-3158, the CRFC easement agreement, and whereas in accordance with the approval and to provide for vehicular and pedestrian connection between the facility and a private road at the site known as Red Tail Pass, and emergency access to the facility, grantor desires to construct a roadway, Silent Road, over a 50 foot wide portion of the grantor parcel and SRFC easement area, Silent Easement area, generally shown on the plan entitled Proposed Easement Plan EA 1.0, prepared by VHB Engineering Surveying Landscape Architecture and Geology PC, last revised on March 8, 2022, the plan, and whereas emergency services will be provided to the facility by the town and any and all other emergency service providers, collectively the providers, by and through Silent Road, and whereas grantor des desires to grant to Silent an easement for the construction, operation, and maintenance of Silent Road as he defined herein, and grantor and Silent desire to grant the to the town and providers certain access rights over Silent Road, and whereas the silent easement agreements annexed hereto have been reviewed and approved by the town en engineer, and whereas the silent easement agreements annexed hereto have been reviewed and approved by the planning board attorney, and whereas the silent easement agreements annexed hereto have been reviewed and approved by the attorney to the town, now therefore be it resolved as follows. The recitation set forth above are incorporated in this resolution as if fully set forth and adopted herein. To the town board of the town of Amenia supervisor hereby authorizes the town supervisor the town board of the town of Amenia hereby yeah. authorizes right. the town supervisor to execute the silent easement agreement in substantially the same form as the next here too. So we just strike uh, the town board. You just do the strike the town of Amenia supervisor. Uh, I'll make that motion. I'll second that. The proper amendment should state. Uh, in the resolve paragraph number two, uh -huh. super, the first supervisor should be removed. Just right. Supervisor. Oh, oh, uh, the oh, town oh, board the, of the town, town board of the town of Amenia. Right, 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 right. So we leave in of the town of Amenia. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Deputy Supervisor Doyle? Yes. Councilpersons Blackman? Yes. Rebeller? Yes. Okay, other matters? We have any. We don't have any in our packets. Um, you, town you, board comments? Wait, did you want oh, to say oh, something? Oh, other matters. Under, under Charlie, matters? Yes. would you like to talk about your grant? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. I so, thought there was another matter. There's another. No, there's always many. Okay. Um, yeah, so I emailed the town board on Monday uh, about this $15,000 grant through um, uh, community health or something? Yes, thanks. The okay. community health and the grant is Cultivating Health Grant is the name uh -huh. of it. Um, and it's a $15,000 grant for uh, workforce housing. So I would like the board's permission to be able to apply for that under the supervision of the supervisor. Um, and I sort of laid out the, the grant. I mean, it's the perimeters, the parameters are, are very large. I would write it so that it could be used for um, the, uh, the parcel that we're looking to purchase, um, and if that didn't come to fruition, that we could actually use the funds for other um, affordable housing uh, initiatives. 
So the first uh, first goal would be to use it towards the acquisition of the property for affordable housing. Yeah, exactly. Well, it would be for the the acquisition cost has already been um, allocated between the um, ARPA funds and the uh, Dutchess County uh, block grant. Okay. Should we get that? Um, so this would go to further rehabilitate the house. Okay. Should that be needed, as well as uh, to cover startup um, expenses. We had, just so the board knows, Leo was there, but uh, Dutchess County came and did their inspection of the property um, last week. And um, although we have a budget to do rehabilitation on the project and there is contingency in that, there may be a couple of things that come up that would um, need to be done. So additional funds are always helpful. Um, this, this grant does not have a match um, and it also is not a reimbursement, so you actually get the funds. Um, prior to doing the, the work. And we, um, it sounds like we all agreed that it should be, if awarded, those monies would be deposited into the wor workforce housing fund. Well, Victoria had some things, I don't, I personally could care less where they go, it's, as long as they're in an account with the town and are able to be used or allocated or um, earmarked for uh, workforce housing, affordable yeah. housing purposes. Okay. Yes. Um, and maybe Ian can actually clarify this because um, the supervisor had a comment related to what funds could go into the um, Workforce Housing Trust Fund. Right. Um, she felt on email that only fee in lieu of payments could go into that account. However, you had a different interpretation because the money that we received from the mini grants over the summer went into that account. Right. And the way the law reads is that it is the fee in lieu of plus grant funds or I think it actually says gifts and other things. It's very wide open. There are other provisions, you are correct, there are other provisions in the wording. I don't recall it exactly off the top of my head, uh, but uh, I do recall other provisions to that, not just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so my understanding is that anything for affordable housing would go there, but. Um, what is the deadline for that grant? There is no oh, deadline. It's rolling. It, it, it's rolling. Right. Um, I would just like to, you know, Get I going. like to do things sooner rather than later. Uh -huh. um, so. They, um, it's a rolling thing, so you can apply any time, and then the award is generally six weeks after. So it would be nice to know that we, we had that. So you're, let me make it sh clear that you are asking for, you are asking us to authorize you and the supervisor to apply for a grant from, uh, cult, um, what is it called again, the health, um, community for Health. Community for Health. And it is not for the purchase of 74. No. It would be for, for rehabilitation. further rehabilitation okay. and startup costs. Okay. As well as other affordable workforce housing initiatives. The application would be broad. Okay. Um, I would be prepared to uh, make that motion if you all felt comfortable with the fact that it is no, um, there's no downside to us that I can think of. There's no match required. There's no reimbursement. You get a, uh, a, a grant of funds and the worst case scenario, we have no affordable housing project to put this money towards it would be sent back, I guess, if there was absolutely nothing. But we have done many projects to try and further mm -hmm. affordable housing and uh, been successful, right? We've done a, a mini grant and uh, several of them successfully. And I think the track record has been good. Yeah, I'd second that. I also just want to thank Charlie for, on his own initiative, researching grants and writing up the applications for housing. I mean. Your devotion is very impressive, um, but thank you for uh, you know for keeping an eye on all that stuff. Thanks, and I will say that the um, uh, Community for Health is a really amazing organization, and they are really trying to um, have an impact, um, a community level impact, and that's why they fund these initiatives. Um, I think it's a really great partner, and they. 
appear to have been very impressed with the way we used our mini grant money. Um, I think that it was very impactful for the community. Yeah, I spoke to the ED and she was very complimentary. Um, and I think it's actually uh, the Community Health Foundation. Oh, I'm sorry, what did I say? I don't know, but you would change oh. those, but something like that anyway. So would this be a problem if we put this into a resolution for our meeting on March 16th? Mm -hmm. Is that or do we need a resolution or can that just be a motion since it's just no this should be this should be done by a formal resolution to outline and, and document the parameters so um, that's very and, very clear yeah, and I, I know the application itself it. would be very very clear yeah. what it's for but I think if you can wait till the 16th I guess that would sure be I'll send some wording perfect okay perfect. thank okay. you thank, thank you, you Charlie. Charlie town board comments um, Mm, nothing new or exciting except that the rec committee, the um, the full-time rec director has just been getting set up in town hall in an office here, um, which is exciting that that's gotten that far. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I don't think the, I, I can't think of anything from my various other committee. Well, we did have a, an informational meeting uh, about the um, landscape plans as oh, they're right. developing Sorry. for the various recreational um, projects that we had hoped to achieve. And so, if you, I'm sure you've gotten a copy of that, the landscape plans. Yes. Um, it's very informative, very helpful. It's very preliminary. So I think any comments that you might have about the proposed um, improvements, uh, this is a good time to jump in because if you wait, you may not get the swing set that you wanted or the <laughs> playground that you wanted or whatever. So um, it's very um, beginning stages and this is a great time for you to weigh in. It's, um, you know, they've hired, the Recreation Commission has hired a professional landscape architect to look particularly at the Wasaic Park, which we all understand is hard to find and um, has some, some uh, issues, issues that, that make it difficult to develop all of the ideas that we had wanted for it. So the landscape architect is helping to um, understand what its um, pros and cons are and we're trying to, you know, it's a great, it's an amazing uh, resource. The is it the Weebatuck Creek that comes through there? I think it's the is the Weebatuck. It's the Wasaic. It's the Wasaic, Wasaic that Creek. goes through there. It's a, a very very special trout fishing stream, and it's got. So we want to try and help make enhance those. Um, uh, options for access and make sure that that's protected and uh, but I think you really need to look at the plan and all of the different uh, options that are being promoted there so that you can help weigh in and what's best for our community with our limited resource and our particular um, assets that we have. Uh, I would also on town board comments, I would say that uh, I'm remiss. I need to look at the February minutes and oh. that's for the March 16th minutes. We can, we can do that. And I wanna make sure we remember to appoint the water committee that members that we started interviewing. There are still openings available. Um, if you haven't had a chance to think about being and serving on the water, water district committee, uh, you can get your application to Don Marie, our town clerk, and have them here by the 9th uh, at, at noon. noon. And we can consider you and set you up for an interview on the 16th at 6.30 or thereabouts. So that's, um, there are other openings as well. And if you want to um, learn more about what opportunities there are to serve on committees, please ask Don Marie. And that will be posted on the website, too, presumably. Yes, next week the new openings will be posted okay, great. now that they've been accepted. Okay. Any other town board comments? Nope. No. No? Um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And it is 8.38. And thank Everybody's you all for attending. We're very excited when there's a crowd. Thank you. It's great. Uh, Deputy uh, Supervisor Doyle? Yes. Uh, Council members Blackman? Yes. Reveler? Yes. So we have an equal.